Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, we continue our series on farm stress with the emotional story of Stephen Sanford. In Southern Gardening, viewers want to know letters from Gary's mailbag. Plus, while many of us enjoy holiday meals, one group making sure others won't go without. And back on our series, Stephen Sanford survived this wreck, but his recovery was gut-wrenching. Farm Week starts right now. Merry Christmas everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell, good to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Merry Christmas from me as well. This week in Extended Story, the fourth installment of our Emmy-winning series, On the Farm. Today, the heart-rending story of Mississippi farmer Stephen Sanford, who faced extraordinary hardship completely out of his control. This story is made possible by MSU Films and producer James Parker. farm about about 2,500 acres. Me and my dad and my brother. Be about 1,800 acres of soybeans, 300 acres of peanuts, and 400 acres of corn, and, and a little bit of sorghum. Milo, we grow a couple of hundred acres of it a year. And we run 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 about three thousand head of uh, of uh, winter calves, winter feeder cattle. Yes. Sir. Got it there now. When did you get into farming? Did you always know this? Well, I was just just raised up in it. My dad carried me with him when I was little, you know, and and just I just got started started like that. I reckon probably about 1979 or something. I was nine years old. And I'd ride with him on a tractor, and I reckon I was probably about 11 or 12 I started driving, you know, doing around distant and doing for them, and uh, it just, was just kind of in your blood, you know. There was never any doubt you'd be a farmer? Never really any doubt, you know. Never was. What, what are some stresses that farmers face? Well, just weather. Weather, I guess. And, Money, some money, you know, trying to trying to make it. I'd say from the early '80s to the to the mid '90s, it was it was you know it was just it wasn't it wasn't no money in it. We was just doing it, just doing it because we liked doing it. It's the only reason we kept doing it, you know. It wasn't to make money. <laughs> it definitely wasn't to make no profit. And help nowadays, finding help. If you work, that's a pretty good stressor because you can't much find nobody that wants to, you know, that, that, that'll work. It's, it's about 15 to 20 percent farming on our end and the rest of it's mechanic in it. I mean, just, just preparing, getting stuff ready to farm, you know, that's what a lot of people want a job. They think that's all we do is just go out there and drive a tractor, you know, but it's a, 
you work all you work on that stuff all year to get to drive it for two months out of the year. I mean, you 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 getting it, keeping it maintained and all. You know, it's a lot more to it than just people pass by and just think you out there driving a tractor. Would you call that a, a farm stress? Yeah, it is, but it's just really a necessity. I mean, you just got to try to keep it good while things is good because you don't ever know what you're going to have to go through or how long it's going to be, you know. Tell me about the wreck. Well, the wreck, we was, in May, we do, we ship a lot, you know, all them yearlings, the cattle I was telling you about, we run in the winter. My brother also runs probably 2,000 head of his own, you know, so that puts us about 5,000 to ship in May. So that's pretty much what we do every morning during, the, during May. We started at Bellevue that morning and loaded, I think, five or six loads and, uh, of cattle. We got through with that and was moving the corral and all the stuff to another location to load the next morning. And we was, got to uh, Summerall and hit 42 West and was headed headed down through there just like any normal day. And, uh, and in a minute I heard tires squealing and, and seen a step side pickup coming at me and, it, and he hit us. I mean, just pretty much a head on accident. I remember I, I turned it, you know, to the right to keep from just getting a dead head-on impact, and I think he hit me in the front left-hand wheel right about the tire. And it, it threw us off in the ditch and stayed pinned in, it, pinned in there for uh, pretty close to an hour, I think. So, Stephen survived the accident, but was unprepared for what was to come in the months ahead. We'll have the conclusion of his story later in the show. In other news, if you've been watching the show lately, you've heard that Southern Gardening host Gary Bachman is retiring at the end of December. We've got a chance to talk to him on camera and asked him about what stands out in his mind about the series. He said the impact on the audience, and he gave us an example. We were at uh, Miss Jane's house, and the garbage guys were going by. And they stopped the truck and one of the garbage men came running over. He says, I love Southern Gardening. The guy's name was Eugene, really a nice guy. And it just was just amazing that he would take the time out to say that, you know, and, and, say, and say thank you for what, for what we were doing. And, and I think that's the kind of, I don't know if it's recognition or satisfaction or, or pride in the work that our team here at MSU as far on the video side has, has really accomplished over the 13 years. You know, and I look at getting ready to retire. We're coming up on Southern Gardening version 3.0. I just wonder where we're going with that now. And with that in mind, an encore story from Gary. As you might expect, he gets a lot of questions from viewers about their gardens. So, in today's mailbag story, Gary answers a couple of those questions, one about tomatoes and another one about the popular strategy of growing in containers. Here's Gary. My email box is always overflowing with landscape and garden questions from gardeners wanting advice and tips on how to be successful. Today I'm going to answer a couple of these questions and help you out too. Hey Doc, this year I want to start my own tomatoes from seed. What tips can you give me? John, great question. A fantastic way to get started is with a cell tray and clear dome. Sometimes they're called a seed starting greenhouse and had everything needed to grow more than enough seedlings for your garden. Your local garden center will have the supplies you need. A good time to start your seedlings is six weeks before transplanting into the garden. Follow the directions and next spring and summer you'll be enjoying fresh homegrown tomatoes. 
Gary, I want to start growing in containers like you're always talking about. What kind of dirt should I put into these pots? Lorraine, to be successful growing in containers, you have to use potting mix made for containers, which is much different than regular garden soil. When choosing a container potting mix, I always look for these ingredients. Sphagnum peat or core coconut fiber adds bulk and substance while being extremely lightweight and has good water holding capacity. And perlite or vermiculite, which provides aeration and improves water drainage. Use a potting mix with these ingredients and you'll be sure to grow like a pro. So keep sending me those questions to southerngardening at msstate.edu and I'll keep answering them as fast as I can. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up, the conclusion of our emotional story of Mississippi farmer Stephen Sanford. Farming is hard enough, he says, with weather, prices, and any number of other factors thrown in. But in his case, a car accident added not only immeasurable physical pain, but monumental stress as well. His recovery, as you'll see, was gut-wrenching. The conclusion of our extended story on the farm, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home, that my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Before the COVID-19 outbreak, the USDA estimated that one out of eight Americans were without reliable access to affordable, nutritious food. That number has increased over the last few years, and yet, and what a shame around the holidays, tons of food still go to waste. But there's a beacon of hope, with one caring group in New York bridging the gap between edible food trashed in landfills and those who would give anything for a taste of it. Here's Peter Tubbs. The last of 22 refrigerated delivery trucks are loaded during the pre-dawn hours in Long Island City, New York. Soon each truck will begin its route to a different section of the five boroughs of New York City, delivering produce and canned goods to 500 food banks and soup kitchens. One million pounds of donated and recovered food is delivered by City Harvest Food Rescue Trucks each week helping fill the plates of the 1.3 million New Yorkers who are food insecure. Basically, we're kind of the middleman. You come into our fold, and what we do for you is you tell us who you are, what you do, when you serve food, and who you serve, and the constraints of your agency. We try to tailor our deliveries to meet those criteria. That's how it works. Uh, some of our agencies serve, you know, 1,500 people in the course of a day. City Harvest sits across the East River from Manhattan. When the group took over the home of a beer distributor in 2011, the three-door loading dock expanded City Harvest's capacity 
and ability to accept temperature sensitive products. Over 20% of households in New York City are defined as food insecure, meaning they either have fewer options than what is recommended by dietitians and the USDA, or a family that experienced skipped meals because they are unable to afford food. So our goal is to fill that gap for people. It's, it's, it's a, an issue of people not having enough money to make ends meet, trying to get food on their table. So we specialize in fresh produce and perishable food. We want to get it out the door. City Harvest was the first food recovery nonprofit in the world when it began in 1982. Among those making donations are local restaurants, green grocers, and produce wholesalers. Unused produce is picked up by City Harvest, which plays matchmaker with a hunger service charity elsewhere in the city. The recovered food is then sorted and delivered to a client that is able to distribute to those who are trying to make ends meet. And we have a basic menu that we work off of, but then on any given day, City Harvest can come up and drop off pounds of, of fresh vegetables that they've rescued from the green market or they've gleaned from a farm in upstate New York. And, you know, we, we have to change quickly and we have to react to that. The Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen, housed in an Episcopalian church built in 1848, feeds over 1,000 guests each day at lunch. The value of City Harvest donation to Holy Apostle is valued at $300,000. What City Harvest believes is their secret weapon is a proprietary algorithm which calculates what food can be donated to which agency, depending on warehouse inventory and what each agency is capable of distributing. Each truck is loaded for the day based on the sales orders generated by the algorithm. The computer program helps agencies across the city receive a more equitable share of what is donated than the randomness of manually creating a distribution list each day. Some donations of recovered food originate with box meal companies that find themselves with surplus ingredients. Truckloads of raw ingredients are donated and sent directly to larger food pantries without passing through the City Harvest Warehouse. A truckload of Canadian sweet corn is being unloaded one pallet at a time. The food distributor who originally purchased the sweet corn was unable to get it to retail stores in Quebec before it ripened. Everything was shipped to City Harvest, knowing it would be fed to those in need while still fresh. Timing produce delivery is a challenge for the grocery industry. Late harvests or shipping delays can result in surplus produce in supermarket warehouses that are unlikely to be delivered and sold to customers at their peak. The solution that makes more economic sense for most operations is to donate the surplus to organizations like City Harvest. The agency also supports growers from outside the region directly. If producers can pack leftover produce into distribution-ready containers, City Harvest can get the overruns to an end user, whether soup kitchen or family. Sometimes if the farmer knew, you just, we'll send the truck, all you have to do is load it up, no worries, we'll pay the bill, that is like music to their ears. If they knew that, once they hear that, they're loading up the truck and ready to go. So we pay the third-party freight, and we help the farmer with some, a little bit of a stipend. The morning rush has slowed at the Sullivan Street Bakery in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. A City Harvest driver stops in to pick up a donation of baked goods that went unsold the previous day. Obviously, as a manager, my job is to try and sell as much bread as I possibly can. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really nice to know that um, you know City Harvest is going to collect our bread and it's going to go on and find a, a second life. Definitely makes you feel better about having that waste at the end of the day because it isn't wasted. Fourteen million pounds of recovered food from places like Sullivan Street Bakery represent one-third of City Harvest's annual distribution volume. Each pound recovered is a pound bypassing a landfill, an already scarce commodity in the densely populated Northeast. Each pound also represents a meal for a person living in New York who is food insecure. We're doing things that genuinely enhance the quality of life of New Yorkers. And I get to see it. I really get to see it. And you can't put a price on that. And now back to our series on the farm. Mississippi farmer Stephen Sanford barely making a profit, hit by an oncoming driver head on. He survived the wreck but faced incredible stress trying to recover. 
Here now at the conclusion, we pick up the story with Stephen in the hospital, two broken legs and a cracked vertebrae. I had a, broke my left leg above the knee and right leg below the knee and a cracked L4, I think, vertebrae in my back. Next thing I know, I woke up, you know, and, and it was, uh, it was, I'd had surgery. It was about 11.30 at night then. Yeah. And they'd fix my legs back. The research shows that while there are some stressors that all families face, whether they're farm families or not, um, farm families do have some unique ordinary stressors as well as extraordinary stressors that they face. And those extraordinary ones are the ones that the farmers themselves and the farm families themselves really don't have control of. Um, and research shows those are particularly difficult. How did it affect the farm? Yeah, it was right in the middle of, you know, we'd had a lot of rain and it throwed us behind and we was trying to plant peanuts and needing to plant soybeans and it just, like I say, it just was, it was a bad, <laughs> it was a worst time it could possibly happen, which any time's a bad time, but it, it, it really was a, it put everybody in a bind. <laughs> You didn't see how you was ever gonna get over this. You just, you know, you think it's just, think you're gonna be like this forever. You, you just like having your hands tied and you can't do nothing. You know, it just, it just, uh, it hurt. It, it, it messes with you mentally. You know, because you know you need to be doing stuff and you need to be active, and there ain't nothing you can do. You sitting in there looking out the window and hearing tractors crank up, well, I wonder where they going now. You'd roll to the front door of the wheelchair and try to look and call somebody and see where they going. Just don't, it, it just was just depressing. The success of a family is central to the um, success of a small farm when we're talking about family farms um, because it's it's all about that family unit working together and, and collaborating to really pull this off. When family members can, can pick up and contribute to um, you know, a, a farm situation, that is gonna help mitigate that stress because that, that farmer doesn't have to worry about, oh, I'm, I'm losing, losing that crop, losing that time to harvest, this is the, the perfect time to do it, and now I'm unab not, you know, unable to do so. Well, I had to, he had that daddy hired, there was some more a guy, Helps another farmer over here, they got caught up and he come helped us and just everybody pitching in, you know, just doing the stuff me and Brian were doing, had been doing, you know, and it, it just it just doubled the workload or, or more on everybody, you know. We got everything, everything, but I think about 150 acres of what we set out to plant, planted. They got, got it all, everything done that could be done. It means a lot to have people, have somebody to do it. I don't know what nobody would do if it was just, if you just was farming on your own and wasn't nobody, you know, you didn't have no family. I don't know what nobody would do if they went through that. You'd just probably be out of business is what you'd be. Because cause they ain't, you just, you can't hire people to do stuff like that, you know, to do it like you need it done. I was just focused on trying to get better and whatever the, like the therapist wanted to do, yeah, I want to do it and I want to do more than what he told me to do because I want to get better quicker, you know, and I just, I believe that's what helped me through it all. My ultimate goal, that's what I told him, I wanted to be able to try to get on the combine and maybe pick a little bit of corn, you know, in the first of September and we met the goal. What kind of feeling does it give you to know where you were at the lowest point and to now be back to? It feels good. It feels real good. You feel like you 
feel like you're doing what you, you know, doing what you're supposed to be. Feel like you're taking up your part of the slack now, you know. You know, your part of the job. Now I'm back contributing, you know. It's, you're back doing what you need to be doing. And you know what you can do, I ain't, I ain't no 100%. I ain't, I ain't a third of what I'm going to be here in a few months, but I, or was before the wreck, but I'm, you got to start somewhere. An incredible story. Very important, if you or someone you know is in emotional crisis, call or text 988 anytime for confidential free crisis support. Well, next time on Farm Week, Ag Drones coming to the rescue. It's a newish technology building on an old one using drones to fight pests in the field by delivering sterile insects to mate with them. It's a new spin on something called SIT. We'll meet the owners of a company who helped pioneer this biocontrol technique. They even designed their own drones just to make it work. That story launches next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching. Merry Christmas.